Hi, my name is Jesse, and I serve here at Real Life Church as one of the pastors. And I want to take a moment before we jump into the message to say thank you for engaging with us. We believe that this message is going to lift up your faith and lead you to encounter God through His Word. If you haven't already, we would love for you to take a second and subscribe to our YouTube channel. This way you can stay engaged and up to date on the latest message and it helps us get the message of the gospel out to others. Again, thank you so much for joining us from Sacramento and beyond and we trust that you will be blessed by the message today. Event. Real Life Church, are you ready for the word today? Yeah. Awesome, man, y'all y'all love your Bibles more than the first service. Amen, don't tell them that though, don't tell them that. Uh, as always, we wanna greet our online campus, those of, us, uh, those of you worshiping online with us, we love you, uh, we pray God's blessing and favor on your life. If you don't have your Bibles, or if you have your Bibles, I'm sorry, you can go to Psalms chapter 23, as we're gonna be continuing our series. If you don't, you can go to Version Bible app, and you can go to events, Real Life Church, and you can see all the notes from today's message. Uh, we are in the week, week two of this series on Psalms 23, and we as a church family have uh, taken the commitment, whether you know it or not, you've committed to it because you are a part of our family, that we want to uh, memorize and hide God's word in our heart. So as you came in uh, today or last week, you should have received a bookmark with Psalm 23 on it. Uh, you might not think, oh, a bookmark's something I need. You could put it on your fridge, put it on the mirror when you're getting ready. We want to remind ourselves of God's word. Psalm 119 says that I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So whether you are here today, maybe you have times at times struggling with temptation or sin, can I tell you God's word actually helps you with that, overcome those temptations. And so we are on a journey of understanding and hiding Psalm 23 in our heart, and we're doing so together. So I'm gonna ask if you would all stand to your feet as we recite Psalm 23 together. Here we go on the count of three. One, two, three. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows." Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You may be seated. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the reading of your word. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be like David, to be able to live a life that says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Father, I pray today you would help us to have ears to hear and to receive I pray that you would remove any distractions, any worries, any struggles. Right now, we're here to fixate our eyes, our focus, our heart, our attention on you and your word. So would you help us to receive deep? Would you help the seed, which is the word of God, fall in good soil in our hearts today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, last week I had the assignment and was only able to preach one verse. Today, God has multiplied me, and now we get to go over two verses. So we will be going over uh, Psalm chapter 23, verses 2 and 3, and it says this, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides still waters. He refresh, or restores my soul, and he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The title of this message is, I'm good because he's God. I'm good because he's God. Look, you never say, I'm good because he's God. All the introverts, I'm sorry, we had to do it. I'll never forget, I had a pastor that I used to work with, and every single day, no matter what day of the week it was, he would start his interaction with you by asking you this question, are you good? And, you know, you would just kind of pleasant. She's like, yeah, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. But then he would ask you three or four, five times a day, are you good? You good? You good? And about the sixth time he would ask you, I would find myself just saying, you know, I'm not good, actually. This is what's going on in my life. And, and he just had a way of getting past our, our quick, dismissive, I'm good uh, responses. This phrase, I'm good. See, I'm, I'm fascinated by the English language because we just make up any rules that we want. 
We change the definition of things all the time, but this phrase to say I'm good is a way to say no thank you. It's just a way to do it with a little more unction, a little bit more boldness or swagger to be like, no, 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 I'm good off of that. I don't need that. And I started thinking about what are some moments that we should have used or should use this phrase, I'm good. A perfect example of when you should say I'm good is when you're helping yourself to the third slice of chocolate cream pie. (laughs) That's a good moment to pause and say, you know what? I'm good. Another opportunity would be you're at a gas station at night and somebody approaches you with an opportunity to make you some money. No, that's the time to get in your car and just say, God bless you, I'm good. Another opportunity could be a friend or a coworker who invites you over to come watch the game on Sunday morning and you know it will mean that you have to miss church. No, thank you. I'm good. In all seriousness, we as his, as his people must learn to say, I'm good to the things of this world. We have to learn to say, I'm good to the things that the enemy or just culture or our own selfish desires would try to offer us. If we fail to say, I'm good to some of these things, we are willingly going to find ourselves living in a life that has lack. We will find ourselves not with a shepherd leading us, but if we can learn to say, I'm good, then the shepherd promises to start taking us to green pastures, taking us to still waters. Now, when I say that the shepherd wants to take us to green pastures, it's likely this image that you have in your mind. This image of a sheep that is going to be in this beautiful, luscious green grass. It has an abundance and a surplus of life and all the pickings of whatever grass it wants to eat. This looks peaceful. It looks nice. It looks therapeutic. And we think, oh, yes, that's exactly the place where God wants me, and that's where he's calling me to green pastures, to live a life of blessings on top of blessings on top of blessings. See, this green pasture right here, it's beautiful. It's pleasant. It's peaceful. It's like, yeah, I want to live there. Just as the shepherd cares for his flock, providing for their every need, so does God provide for us abundantly, leading us to places of abundance and ensuring our well-being. And that's what we thought. But what if when God says he wants to lead us to a place of abundance, instead of looking like those green pastures, it looked like this. Would you struggle to believe that he truly is leading you to a land or a place of abundance? See, what you see is actually what David meant for us to see, but our Western minds thought the previous image was what a green pasture was. But no, this is the Judean wilderness. This is the area in which a shepherd would lead his flock. This is the space, this land that lacks a lot of color is where David said, those are my green pastures. Those are my still waters. It does not look like a land or terrain that has a lot of waters. There's not rivers just rushing right through it. And when we get the accurate picture that the the land in which God is leading us can be tumultuous, there can be mountainous ranges There can be valleys low and mountaintops high. There can be rough terrain, dirt and rocks, debris are what acquaint us. This is the land in which we see that our good shepherd leads us to green pastures. But it takes a shepherd with a trained eye. It takes a shepherd who knows how to navigate his flock, who knows the right place to take them. Oftentimes, we can mislabel or, or, or see the season of life that we're in incorrectly because it doesn't match what our picture is to what God's reality is. See, we often say, oh, I'm not blessed, or oh, I, I'm not in a green pasture, I'm not in a good season because it's not lining up, it's not fitting in our image, but rather we have to say, no, God, you determine. It doesn't matter what my eyes might see. You are the one that is going to supply my needs. Today, we're going to learn that the shepherd is the supplier. The shepherd is the supplier. He supplies safety for our bodies. He supplies peace for our soul. He supplies direction for our future. The shepherd is the supplier. Supplying safety for our bodies. See, last week we learned that when we have the good shepherd, we truly lack nothing. Verse 1. But verse 2, David is giving us a more detailed description of why it is we could say that we truly lack nothing, and that is the truth. Because God is going to lead us to green pastures. He's going to lead us to places of rest 
and restoration for our souls. Green pastures are not places that are teeming with life or that have a massive surplus of resources. No, green pastures are where God gives us the daily provisions needed for our rest. I'm reminded of the people of Israel in Exodus chapter 16. You know, they were hard-headed, stubborn people, and they began to complain and grumble about how the food in Egypt was a lot better. How many of y'all can relate to grumbling and complaining about the food? And so God, Moses goes and talks to God, and, and God has a plan. He says, I'm going to provide for the people food. They're not going to starve while they're in the wilderness. And so God's plan is to provide through manna and quail. Now, God was very specific when he said, you will only go out each day and grab what you need for that day. Well, like, you know, a good Israelite, they were hard-headed and stubborn. They didn't listen. And some of them tried to store up for themselves extra food. They were hoarding it. And the Bible would tell us that all the food they try to hold on to beyond what they needed for their daily provisions will become spoiled or rotten. See, God wants you and I to live a life that is completely dependent on him for what we need in just that moment. Because it's not about having a savings account, it's about having a shepherd. See, we often in our minds think we need to have more and more stored away and hidden away for a hard time. But when you have a shepherd that is leading you, even when the land looks like that, he knows exactly where to find green pastures. He knows exactly where to find still waters. See, we need to understand that it's not about all the provisions that God can give us, but it's about just following the shepherd and not losing sight of our dependence on him. But looking for him to lead us and guide us to the places that he wants us to go. Now, the sheep had to make a decision, though, and they had to make a decision to continually say yes to following the shepherd because there was no place on that video where it was just grass for miles and miles and miles. No, there would be a little patch over here, a little patch over there, maybe just a mouthful over here. And so what it would require is the sheep to be dependent from meal to meal, moment to moment on their shepherd. But that means they had to continually say yes to following God's will, following God's plan. Some of us at times, we've said yes to God, being the Lord of our life, our Savior, our shepherd, our guide, but we stopped saying yes to following him three years ago or three months ago. We allowed him to lead us to one place, but then when he said it's time to get up and go to this place, well, we thought we had it figured out. We thought this was the, no, no, this is the direction we should go. Come here, yeah, some of us are backseat drivers when it comes to leading our lives. We're trying to tell God, no, this is the direction. But we have to be willing to say, yes, I will go right here, and now, yes, I will go over there, and now, yes, I will go over here. It is a continual daily yes to saying, the Lord is my shepherd. I will follow him where he leads me, knowing that there is a promise and an assurance that green pastures are ahead of me. But it comes with a continual yes to God. Our journey with God will take us to new places and familiar ones. And in my experience, God taking us to new places are not the hard areas to follow him. It's when he wants to take us back to a familiar place that we stop trusting him. It's when he wants us to revisit something that we've been trying to hide for years. It's when he wants to bring up that thing that we try to bury, uh, uh, bury or lock it away so that no one ever know about it. And he wants to bring it to the surface to deal with it. That's when we stop trusting him. That's when we like, God, why are we back to this place? I don't want to go back here. But he wants to bring us back there so that we can learn the lesson that we were supposed to learn in that season. See, God wants to guide us and lead us. And he promises something that I think could be a little offensive at face value. And the promise is that he will make us lie down. Now, some of y'all, if you like me and you got submission issues at times, you don't like the fact that the Bible says he's going to make you lay down. You're like, he ain't going to make me. Ain't nobody going to make me do nothing. I'm a grown man. I pay my bills. I do this. I... No, he makes me lie down. And I think in our minds we get this picture. There's a clip you're going to see on the screen. We get this picture of God as this shepherd coming in WWE style to put us in a chokehold to bring us down to the ground to pin us. Like, you see this sheep, this looks uncomfortable. This looks a little humiliating. This looks a little uh, unnatural. That doesn't look like a natural way 
a sheep should recline. But this is sometimes the picture that we have of God making us lie down. We think it's with his strength and his might. We think it's with coercion and him just saying, no, this is what you're going to do because I'm God. When in fact, the Lord making us lie down should look like this. Now this looks peaceful. This sheep is chilling. This sheep is happy. There is no one pinning this sheep down. And what we're seeing is a sheep that is fully content. Now, I'm not a sheep and just like dirt, but that looks like a good piece of dirt and grass to lay in if you ask me. And so the sheep is lying down. Why? Because sheep will actually lie down when all of their needs are being met. When they've had their fill that they need for the day, when they've had water. In other words, when God provides all that we need, we are at peace to lie down. Not just because we have all of our provisions, but a sheep will only lie down when it feels and senses it is in a safe place. It's in an environment where it is fully able to relax and able to recline. Come on, y'all been in a situation, maybe you don't want to admit it, but you know, someone's like, oh no, go ahead and sit down. And you're like, I'm not sitting down because I don't know what's about to pop off, right? Somebody start kind of acting crazy and the crazier they get, the more you kind of back up. You're like, I ain't laying down. I'm not reclining. I'm not sitting because I don't know what you're going to say or do. When God is leading us and he is our shepherd, his gentle, tender care to our lives causes us to lie down because we have every single thing we need, because we have safety, we have provision, we have direction. That is what it means for the Lord to make us lie down. Imagine a world that is so good that all we have to do is just enjoy it and rest in it because he's got everything covered. He's thought through all the planning. He's prepared all of our needs, all of the necessities, and now our response as being those in his flock, is to sit and rest in him. There comes a time that you got to stop wrestling against God and start resting in God. You got to stop wrestling with him. It's not a battle you're going to win. When you will find victory is when you start resting in him and his provision. The shepherd wants you and I living a life that is lying down in green pastures. Remember, it's not that first picture. But he does promise and he does want us to live a life that is lying down in green pastures, still waters, bringing peace to our lives. Revelation uh, 7.17 says this, For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Finding rest in the Lord does not mean you won't shed tears. However, it does mean that there are better days ahead. It does not mean there won't be adversity. It does not mean there won't be challenges or hardship. It does not mean that this patch might run out of grass and we got to get up and we got to go on an arduous journey to get over to a new place where there's new streams. There will be challenges when we follow God. But there's the assurance and promise that he is there with us, that he is guiding us and leading us. He's not leaving us abandoned or forsaken to deal with it ourselves. So he leads us to green pastures and besides still waters. And he supplies peace for our soul. We just prayed for peace. How many of you could use more peace in your life? See, I think we actually love this ideation of living a peaceful life. However, at times our actions can show a little differently. Uh, I'm fascinated when people do things that I think are crazy and weird. And uh, I stumbled upon a show one time called Storm Chasers. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Uh, Y'all have? For real? Y'all like me, you like these people crazy, right? Yeah, exactly. And let me read you a little description of storm chasers. That just blessed my soul that y'all knew that. This is the description of storm chasers. Every spring, changing weather patterns on the Great Plains, also known as Tornado Alley. Right there, I'm good. Tornado Alley? Create a recipe for catastrophe and a collection of scientists and enthusiasts brace for a season of storm chasing. I love watching people do crazy things that I think they're a fool for doing. These people get excited and jacked up. We in California, it rains a little bit. We're like, oh, no, we can't drive anywhere. We freak out. These people see tornadoes, like the size of this room. It just took out a whole neighborhood. And they're like, oh, hop in the truck. Let's go. Come on, Billy. And they're running, you know, and they're going over there. And they're excited about it. I don't know what kind of childhood they had 
what kind of upbringing that made them say, you know what, mom, dad, when I get older, I'm going to be a storm chaser. <laughs> I've never met someone to this day that when you ask them about what their career is or what they study, they're like, I'm a storm chaser. This is what I want to do with my life. I want to hop in a truck that's a lot smaller than that whole brick building that just went flying away, and we're going to drive right in the center of it. That sounds like a great idea. Now, we laugh, and we think these people are crazy, which they are. But yet, if we began to ask the closest people who are in our lives what it is that we do professionally, their response might be, oh, no, you're a storm chaser. You spend your life going from problem to problem, from chaos to calamity, from broken relationship to drama to drama. You were mad at this person last week, that person two years ago, and now you got an issue with this person. You spend your life always going from storm to storm to storm, from drama to drama to drama, and you think we're crazy from looking at you crazy. but you're actually living your life as a storm chaser. Why is it that everybody you come into contact with is messed up except you? Why is it that every person who employs you is a crooked, uh, evil boss, but you are just a saint of an employee? You're a storm chaser. And instead of getting stuck in this cycle of chaos and calamity, Instead of chasing storms, let's be people who chase after the shepherd, who cares for the deep parts of our soul, restoring us back to his original origin or original nature of our lives. But it's a choice to stop chasing the storm. When David says that he, he restores my soul, what he's saying, that word means that he, he's turning back our soul, back to the original intent that he created it for before the fall of the world. He's restoring us. He's turning us back to the place in which he fashioned us to operate in. There is rest for your soul. There is refreshing waters that can come into our lives and that can heal us and bring us back to the place that God wants us to be. So whether it's our physical needs or the tender care of our souls, God wants us to know he is our provider. There is rest. There's rest available, friends. There is a life that has peace. You can trust in him today and allow him to satisfy your soul. I didn't say solve all your problems, but your soul can be satisfied. There's a difference. We have to stop putting conditions on him satisfying our soul and him bringing uh, all of our needs that we need, not just the wants that we have. He is your portion. He is your provider. Let the shepherd be your God and enjoy the peace of being in his flock. Let him be God. Your peace is found in the provider, not in the provisions. Peace is not about how much we can acquire. Peace is not about how many things we can possess. Peace is directly correlated to proximity with him. Our peace is contingent upon how close we are to the shepherd. Man, if I was a sheep in Jesus' flock, I'm like, I want to be the sheep that walks right next to him. I'll be bumping the other sheep. I'll be bumping y'all out of my way. I'm like, y'all better move. <laughs> That's my shepherd. I'm going to stay close. But it's conditional. It's, it's contingent upon us being close to him and seeing him as the only source of provision that we need because he is that provider. He is that. He is the one that leads us to still waters. He is the one that makes us lie down in green pastures. He is the one that returns our soul back into the place that it was supposed to be in the first place. Lastly, he supplies direction for our future. The good shepherd supplies direction for our future. When you are in the care of the shepherd, the good shepherd, your eyes are not on what is missing in your life, but on what you have as him as your guide. When you are under his care, you're not worried about what's missing. You're just fixated, and you're satisfied with where he is guiding you and leading you. I have a video I want us to watch that I think will really drive home this idea of green pastures and still waters, but while also introducing this last point about how we need a guiding shepherd to lead us in our lives. Turn your attention to the screen. So this is a tuft of grass growing in the desert. 
See, what happens is at night, warm air from the Mediterranean blows across the desert. And when that warm, humid air hits the side of a hill or the side of a rock, a tuft of grass like this will pop up overnight. Now, in this sort of green pasture, the sheep has just enough for one mouthful. Then the sheep has to look to its shepherd to say, where's the next mouthful? And then it looks for the next mouthful, the next mouthful, and the next mouthful. In the green pastures that David wrote about, the sheep rely completely on their shepherd. If you're anything like me, you'd rather imagine a green pasture with knee-high grass as far as the eye can see. But I'm afraid that in that kind of green pasture, we would have no need for a shepherd. In a culture that tells us to value our independence, God is calling us to be dependent on him, trusting our shepherd to lead us to every mouthful. The Hebrew word for path used in Psalm 23 is the same as the word used to describe someone walking around in circles. Now, when a shepherd needs to get their sheep down from a hill in the desert, they can't just let the sheep run straight down or they'll get injured because the hill is so steep. So instead, they lead the sheep around the mountain in circles. Over the years, the sheep have worn these paths into the side of most hills. This is what the Bible is referring to when it speaks of paths of righteousness. This is how the shepherd of Psalm 23 gets the sheep safely down the mountain. Psalm 5, 5, 8 says, Lead me in the right path, O Lord, or my enemies will conquer me. Make your way plain for me to follow. We have to understand that Jesus wants to be the leader of our lives. He wants to direct us and guide us to where we should go. At times, we can look to Jesus and say, he's so kind and compassionate and loving, and we can forget that he is the leader in our lives. He's the Lord in our lives. That means he has authority. He has the, the jurisdiction to speak into the direction that we would go in our lives. And he wants us following him as he chooses the right paths, the righteous paths for our lives to go in. But we must get to a place where we are no longer asking God to bless the path that we are going on, and choosing and saying, God, would you, would you bless the path that I'm choosing? And rather, we need to say, God, I want to choose the path that you're blessing. See, we get caught up in life, and we can go, and we can make our own decisions. And we can say, oh, I know what's best for me. And we get a couple miles into it, and we're like, oh, this was a mistake. Lord, would you bless my way? Would you order my steps? And we even quote scripture when we are completely out of the will of God. When we could have made the choice to say, God, I see your blessing on this path, and I see you're leading and guiding, that's the path that must be best for me. Not my will, but your will be done in my life. See, it says that he does this for his own name's sake. See, a shepherd's reputation would be contingent upon its ability, their ability, to lead the flock from one destination to another. We see in the video that as this flock would be at the top of a mountain, that it would be up to the shepherd to be able to ensure everybody's safety in getting down. But it doesn't look how we would want it to look. See, we would stand on a mountain and we could look down and say, oh, that's the clearest path. That's the easiest way. That's the fastest way. But that doesn't mean it's the safest way or the shepherd's way. And so what can happen in our lives is we stop following God because we think he's just walking us around in circles around this mountain. We don't see any progress in our lives. We don't see any forward progression in our lives, and so we think he's not actually who he says he is, when in fact he is leading you on the right path, when in fact he is going to get you to that destination, but we must allow Jesus to lead us and to guide us. He will not lead us astray for his own namesake is attached to the direction that he gives us. Leonard Ravenhill says this, a true shepherd leads the way, he does not merely point to the way. What good news it is to know that our shepherd doesn't simply just say, well, you should go over there and do that. But they say, you know what? No, let me lead you there and show you the way. Let me show you exactly where you should put your feet on what steps are, sh are sure footing and what steps are not. Let me show you the exact way and path forward to get to those green pastures, to get to a life that has rest for your soul. 
that has peace unspeakable. You know, at the end of first service, it was an interesting thing. There was two gentlemen here uh, that I, I've known from back when I was a heathen. So I was a little nervous. They knew me back when I was in high school. Actually, one of them knew me since I was five years old. Me and him grew up together playing basketball. His dad was my coach for about I don't know, over a decade. I haven't seen either of these guys 10 plus years easily. And my memory of them was probably their memory of me, and none of us were serving the Lord on the right path. And so you can imagine this kind of weird moment. He came up to me, he's like, yeah, I didn't even really recognize you because I'm thinking, why is he in this place in this setting? But you know what it showed me? That while at one point, me and that gentleman, we were on the same path and we had a relationship, we had friendship, we played ball together, all these things. God led us both in very different directions, very different paths. But yet somehow, some way, we find ourselves under the same house, under the same roof, worshiping the same God today. That is a result of the good shepherd leading us on paths of righteousness. It might not look like what it looks for you, the person sitting next to you. It could look like, oh, that's a detour, or that's a very long way. I don't want that path. Trust that he's leading you and he's guiding you in the right way. Trust that he's going to take you to the places that you need to be. Even if it doesn't seem like that's the, the greenest meadow of a hillside, he's going to lead you and make you lie down in green pastures. So the shepherd is the supplier. He supplies safety for our bodies, supplies peace for our soul, supplies direction for our future. Max Lucado says this, if you have the shepherd, you have grace for every sin direction for every turn, a candle for every corner, and an anchor for every storm, you have everything you need. When you have a shepherd, you have everything you need. Pastor Brandon and the worship team are going to come, and they're going to lead us in a song. This song is one that echoes the assurance of God that is found when you and I would say yes to having him be our shepherd. That no matter where we go, that the Lord is going to lead us to a place where there is green pastures and still waters. He is going to lead us to a place where he is our provider and that we have peace and refreshing for our soul. So as they sing this song, I just ask that you would reflect on the words of it and hear the promises of God that are true for all of us who would be in the shepherd's flock. Pastor Brandon, would you lead us?
is that he wants to make you and I whole today. He wants our lives to be fulfilled. And the way that he makes us whole is with the two promises that that song just declared. By leading us to green pastures and by leading us to still waters. But there's another promise in this moment that I think precedes those and that's the promise that Jesus offers to every single person. That if we would place our faith, our hope, and our trust in him, that he promises us eternal life. He promises us a life that's not void of hardships, but a life that we get to walk with the shepherd. That as we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that he becomes the good shepherd over our souls and that he tends to our needs, that he cares for us with the greatest level of compassion. And so if you find yourself here today and life seems like you've just been circling or you've been choosing the paths for your life. But today you want to say, you know what? I want to let the shepherd be the one that leads me. I want Jesus to be the one that leads me. And I need to accept him as my Lord and Savior today. I want to give you that opportunity. If you're here today and that's you, I want to pray for you. But I want to know who am I praying for? Would you slip up your hand? Anybody at all? Today you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for your boldness. Anybody else want to join this one? These two. Anyone else want to be led by the shepherd? Thank you. I see this hand. Thank you, sir. I see your hand. The gift of salvation is a beautiful gift that God promises us. It is the beginning of our relationship with him. The fact that Jesus died and rose again so that you and I can live with him in paradise. So that you and I can experience peace even in a broken world. I want to lead us in a prayer of salvation and I mention this often, there's nothing magical about these words, but it's, it's putting language to what God is doing in our hearts. And so as we read this out, I'm going to ask if you would all stand with me. We're going to do this as a family. Because when you come into a relationship with Jesus, you enter into the family of God. So we're going to read this prayer, and it goes like this, if you would follow me. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. 
I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. Right now, I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust you and follow you from this day forward. I confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we celebrate with those four who gave their life to Jesus? Hallelujah. Amen. If you rose your, if you raise your hand, our ushers should have placed something in your hand. But we have a team with a banner back there that I have decided we want to place a gift in your hand. We want to talk with you about the next steps after you have just made this incredible decision to follow Jesus Christ. We are rejoicing and celebrating with you. Well, church family, if you have some uh, prayer requests, our prayer teams, our altar team is on their way. They're going to be up here. But I want to remind you and encourage you as you go throughout this week. Let's be intentional of hiding God's word in our heart. Let's truly seek the good shepherd and let's allow him to lead and guide us and make us lie down in green pastures to restore our soul. If you need prayer, please come. We wanna be able to pray for you. But if not, we love you, we're praying for you. God bless you, church family, and have an amazing week, amen. Hey everybody, I wanna take a moment again and say thank you for joining us. Real Life Church's mission is to engage real life, embrace real people, and encounter the real God. We want you to know that you are a part of that mission. We also wanna make sure that you know about the best way to keep in the know about all things Real Life Church, and that is through our Church Center app. Through this app, you can give, check out groups, look at our events, and even update your profile information. We'd also like to take a moment and thank all of our generous givers. Through your gift, we are able to make a difference for God's kingdom in our community and beyond. There are a couple different ways that you can give virtually, through our Church Center app, via our website at rlcsac.com, or text to give. Text the word give and the amount to 84321. And also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay up to date and encouraged with the latest message. We'd also love to connect with you on our other social media channels where we share everything real life. So see you next time.